should I say that again? <laughs> Take two. Sorry. So how do DevOps enable real-time business decisions for us and also help us break a monolith BI system? That is what uh, we are going to be talking about. I am Pradeep, Senior BI Engineering Manager with Target. My name is Ravi Kumar. Um, I'm a consultant DevOps agile coach and intelligence working along with Target working in the data engineering and analytics space. So yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I'm using it. Okay. So this is where we start off. So why is DevOps so important? Right? Uh, quick story here. I'm not very good at telling stories, but then I'll give it a shot. Right? So this this is an interesting conversation that happened between a mechanic and a surgeon, a cardiac surgeon. Right? The mechanic tells the surgeon, I also work on engines, I repair them, I keep them running, and so do you. The only thing is you I work on a mechanical engine, you work on a heart, but then we essentially do the same job. So then why is it that you are regarded so highly, you paid so highly, while people just think I'm doing a dirty job? Right? Any guesses on what the answer could be? Yeah? Oh wow. Okay. So people are awake. <laughs> so that that is exactly why DevOps is essential. So no one's going to let you bring a system down every now and then and implement changes, but at the same time, changes are so critical in the world that we live in. Right? And if applications are doing it, BI teams need to be able to support that. I don't think BI teams can tell them that. You guys go ahead, change whatever you want. We will do it once in two or three or maybe six months. It's probably going to be useless by then. And that brings out why Data Warehouse really needs to make sure that fresh, reliable, and accessible data is available at all times for the business to make decisions. Right? Uh, no longer does a business implement a strategy, wait for a couple of months, and then see how the strategy works. You'd want to implement the strategy, see the impact, and maybe even make changes on the fly. And that is where DevOps becomes very important for a BI kind of a setup. Right? Having said that, what are some of the challenges that uh, DevOps, implementing DevOps and BI really comes with? For one, the BI systems are usually very tightly integrated. You have multiple sources, multiple consumers. Right? How do you make sure that one change is not impacting another downstream consumer? Or one, uh, you're making changes in a source and that is flowing through and, and it is a tightly coupled system. And the whole enterprise relies on that. You don't have, say, multiple BI systems within a single enterprise. It's very unlikely that you would be doing that. Right? And those are exactly the challenges why DevOps becomes quite an overhead in the BI world. At Target, in addition to all this, we have a we have a mix of legacy and modern systems. We have existing systems which are running on RDBMS. We have modern systems which are running on um, something. It it could be Hadoop. It could be any new form of uh, NoSQL database. All those things kind of work seamlessly. Have to work seamlessly, right? And we also, in addition to these, we have vendor package tools for ETL and reporting. We have our own tools that we are developing. And with all these in the mix, there is there are very few DevOps tools which would actually cater to this sort of a technology stack. We'll probably come to that a little later. But then these are some of the challenges that we face with uh, DevOps in BI and with Target as a focal point. So the, there is a fundamental thing here, right? Uh, any guesses what could be the fundamental thing here Con from a conventional CI, CD implementation in an application space into a data warehousing. We heard some of these challenges. What could be one of the fundamental things? What's our product here? Sorry? Data. Tools. So our, our product is fundamentally data. We, we don't have a sense of an UI or there are certain things that we need to put it into test. We funnel it in through a pipeline like you normally do in a conventional setup. Our product is data. Uh, data which is catering to across target, right? Across multiple business lines. And we are talking about terabytes of data and stuff like that and sources and massaging of the data, ETL, ELT, all of that in the mix. We'll talk about some of those challenges as well as we go into the mix of how we implemented what we implemented 
and I just wanted to get you a perspective as to what is fundamentally our product so that it distinguishes clearly from people who are from the app space and looking at it in a in a in in a, using the same pair of lenses but it could not be true because looking at it viewing it as a data as a product itself is very different uh, it's a very different beast in some sense right so what did our journey look like right this is i mean it is fitted on one slide but it is actually a two year journey right it all started with what we could potentially call a cultural revolution right where did this originate from it originated with the formation of the enterprise data analytics and business intelligence as a pyramid by itself in target uh and that is where we wanted to reach out to our business and see what their pain points were are they getting what they really require and one of the things that we heard loud and clear from them we need to be able to turn around fast and that is where the whole agility mandate started this was way back 2016 so um our leadership came out with an agility mandate right and um i think at that time we were still learning as to what agility means most of us were understood agility as just making sure that you're following all the agile principles which we in hindsight is totally wrong right? so that is how we started off with the agility mandate now what did we do next we had to break down this monolith so now we have one enterprise data warehouse which if you really think of it is a lot of different products but then how do you break that down so we created the agile scrum team so each team had a clear ownership each team owned their data knew what they were responsible for right. so that was the first step that we took towards it next uh, as as we set up these teams we realized that uh, it was not really going the way we thought it will be right just following the agile principles does not change anything fundamental and that is where we set up two uh, or or i should say uh, two of our most significant investments one was setting up the agile ops team so the agile ops team had a very clear mandate make sure that teams are thinking agile and they are not just following the agile principle how do you do that uh, we'll come to that at a later slide but then uh, if you look at all the clouds those are actually the challenges that we faced so not spend too much time each of those but then the agile ops team was essentially helping us with one the cultural shift thinking agile agile planning agile processes and uh how do we move from a waterfall to agile model so those two things were really what the agile ops team started the second most important investment for us was the systems team the bi systems team now they uh and it all started off because we did not have uh, we could not get off the shelf devops products that we could use we had to bring in a lot of different stuff marry them together create a pipeline of our own so what was the systems team doing they were making recommendations they were evaluating some of these tools and making recommendations so this is where we want to draw a clear line between just making recommendations versus governing because we also wanted to democratize the way uh, stuff is done right and that's the whole agile principle so they made recommendations in addition the other very very important uh, i should say contribution that the systems team made was in tailoring the ci cd pipeline for bi so if i was to just walk up to a team and tell them that guys you need to use these two i am sure i would get 100 different versions of the solution right and that becomes difficult to manage because we also want to manage the infrastructure so these teams came up with templates what they called the easy buttons and these we created multiple templates one for the legacy system one for modern system then one for app development but then these were templates that could be used by other teams just customize a little maybe change a thing here or there but then those really drove adoption because teams were now not spending time only on building the pipeline but they were uh the pipeline would be up in a couple of hours and they would start seeing the benefits quicker rather than spending a couple of months trying to build pipeline so i think the um, the fundamental thing is though here um, when we talk about principles or whatever its processes when you do it um, breaking teams having smaller teams how you even 
adhere to some of these processes in the construct of where we are, it becomes hard. I cannot have a user story from a, from a data product perspective, thin slice a story which has to be like an MVP thing. You know, all of those things were actually a roadblock for us. Uh, how do you even cut across multiple business lines and thin slice a story so that a data product or a data engineering team and even the uh, analytics team is looking at that slice cut and stuff like that. So we had to refactor some of those things which will apply into this context and make it also easy for the adoption purpose, right? Um, so Pradeep did mention this took us about two years. I think we started somewhere about 2015, late 2015s in our first avatar of the agile principles, go and do this getting into the training sessions and stuff like that. As we went through the journey, there were a lot of uh, bottlenecks that we had. It's not just about having these teams do what they do. Uh, it's also, you know, be part of them to show them the way to do it. And there were decisions made as we go through, went through the journey and changed some of the thought process we initially started with. Um, so the journey has not ended yet. That's the reason why we, in the yep. topmost corner, we said this journey is still on. We have not reached the stage where we can claim ourselves to be in Nirvana stage. But uh, interestingly, where we've come to is, this was our earlier process. Um, on the top, if you see, from a check-in into the code repository, it used to take us about 30 days approximately to move anything into production uh, when we were. Uh, today, where we are is at about two hours to a day to move anything into production. Uh, we've not changed any of those process steps in the uh, What we have done is automate all of those. Um, put in a lot, in, including how the dependencies are there, what we do, how we do stuff. It's all about automating it. It's not about changing any, you know, dramatically removing any of those. That has given this result, but as we go through it, we'll try to drill down a little more as to how did we come to this two hours from our uh, 30 days. So, uh, obviously, like I said, we went through this learning, right? This was somewhere in, uh, in between. It was not at the outset in 2015, we got this. Uh, we wanted the management to participate, you know, across the teams. How we would do, um, first of all, product thinking has to be there in this team. Each of the teams that we've got are product thinking teams. Uh, the vision, at least, is we need to have product thinking teams across the board. Uh, and every team is set up to be autonomous. Every team is set up to be uh, making their own decisions in terms of tool choices, um, in terms of how they do what they do. Yes, there is aid given from systems team um, the support structures, all of that, but it is more about these teams decide what they do, how they do, uh, in compliance with the results that we are looking at. Uh, governance is not in terms of policing, you have to get this right and that right. It's more about saying, are we doing the right things? Uh, why are we doing these right things? It's not about saying, you are not doing this, you have to get this, and velocity is a metric. And you no, know, so we had data as metrics. We, we used those things so that that resonates well with the business and then work backwards from that perspective. Right? So yep. uh, we have templatized version, which we talked about. Monthly showcase was a big cultural shift. Um, every team in this journey comes together once a month to showcase what they do, how they do it, what are the ch challenges. And if they are not able to embark on this, why is it so? We want to truly learn. And in each of these settings, we have senior leadership teams participating, uh, including the principal engineers, architects, participating in trying to learn how can we put together a system that simplifies adoption for these people. That's the intent behind that. And that's also a huge investment because without that, anything that you do is local optimization. Any external going and doing these things with a team and showcasing with respect to PPTs is not going to funnel in or the kind of interest that we want to see. So what we've said is it's all these teams come there, showcase on their laptops, it's not PPTs, no PPTs. Uh, we want to do it. In fact, uh, we have a demo version, a small demo as to how we do things as we go through that. But I think that this was the crux. This we learned somewhere in between our thing, and it was well supported from the topmost management at the at the CXO level to the thing and how we drill it down. Uh, obviously, we have OKRs to support this. Uh, at the topmost level, we have the OKRs, and there are the product thinking teams. Each of these OKRs at the topmost level is aligned to at the team level. We have not gone at individual level, but at the team level we are doing, we are getting better at it. We are not saying that we have achieved qualitative you know, OKR, but we have done a very good, decent job in the adoption cycle. So this at a high level is how our CICD infrastructure looks. Couple of things um, very common, right? Your Git, Jenkins, uh, Slack, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about Pericert. It is a testing tool that we're using. 
but the most important thing that you would want to look at, or maybe one of the important things, is the whole uh, range of technologies or tools that we are using. Right? And there is a gradual shift from uh, uh, third party supported vendor provided tools towards more open source. And with open source comes the bigger challenge of how do I make sure that all these things are done well enough. Right? Um, if you look at the other thing that we wanted to talk about here is essentially the automated code review. So we do have a lot of tools that cater to app sort of development like you have Sonar. But then for a BI, something that would probably parse MySQL right? or HiveQL. Right? Those kind of tools are not really available in the market or we haven't come across them. And that is where we have asked teams to come up with their own review mechanisms. And a lot of teams have come up with their own code review mechanisms. So it could be something as simple as a shell script. It could be something as complex as building a UI. So uh, I mean, uh, so what I would really like to call out here, as soon as a Jenkins runs, you have a code review that runs. Right? Even though the testing really happens later, code review runs immediately, and any um, any failure on that part sends a message to Slack and we stop the deployment right away. Yeah, so the, I spoke about in the initial listing data is our product, right? So why does it become so critical here? If you look at the stack also, we have data stage and all of this. Fundamentally we are running through sequence of jobs. There are in some of the uh, application that we are applying these uh, sequence of jobs is like thousands of jobs. They are all running sequentially. They are pulling it from the source data, massaging the data, all on the fly. Uh, if we say in a construct of CI, once a check-in, it should come back in 15 minutes. You must be kidding. So it, it doesn't happen in a high volume thing. Yes, I can, I can kind of do it just for the sake of getting, OK, we are doing data. It is only about 100 records. You get this. Fine, that is a different strategy you apply for a certain context. But if I have to do from a business resiliency perspective, whether it's the data right and enabling true decisions, I cannot sacrifice doing it at the cost of don't do pull from the latest source that we have or don't do massage on the fly, don't do your ELT, ETL, you cannot sacrifice it. And also the fact is we are moving from traditional. It's not that we are, we don't have a baggage, right? I mean, I don't want to call it as a baggage. Maybe it's a wrong word. Our business is still running. Uh, it's, it's all, you know, a um, lot of money is being generated out of that. So if you are in certain kind of a, a ecosystem already, transitioning out uh, is also equally challenging. I cannot do a slam dunk approach and then say, remove this and go there. Um, so I think that's where exactly we come from. This is, we've stood it up from a pipeline perspective. We have all of these traditional data, Teradata and your data state jobs running. Um, the challenge here is if something breaks in that entire pipeline of data stage pipeline that we have, I need to rerun it. Usually the problem is with the data qualitative aspect of it. It is not about the technical glitch, oh, I missed this thing. Uh, it could be as simple as I, I missed an index or I instead of using this column to that column is a very small thing. The fix is very small. Uh, the time it takes to run this um, is the cycle time, right? I, I don't have the luxury of speeding it up. And I can speed it up in theory, but in practice I cannot have Docker container do it because it cannot take that massive load. Uh, right, so I have to put it out. So we have to have our own strategies around that, right? Uh, we are learning as we go through this process, but yes, we we have this, and also we have this today, where some of this thing is on the cloud, uh, where the development happens. We still have a lot of the big data kind of investment which are there on the staging and the production environment on our physical servers. It's not still on the cloud cloud, but. Um, the interesting thing um, about this particular pipeline is, uh, yeah, we're testing after we deploy. So for a BI sort of a system, it becomes very difficult for you to test and then deploy because you don't, you can't create data on the fly. So one of the key things that you would want to see here is that we always deploy and then test. So rollback might not always be possible, even though, uh, even as we speak, we are testing out how we could roll back, but then that is something that we have not implemented yet. So testing usually happens after we deploy. The other thing is deploying to prod, right? We're not truly uh, continuous deployment because all deployments into prod are still controlled uh, because we're not, we are still coupled. 
right? We are not so loosely coupled that I could just go ahead and implement something by myself. I am sure that there are a couple of other dependencies that I need to talk to teams about and work them out. So those are the two things that probably are very different. I think in, even in certain contexts, we do test and deploy. Like I said, we are product thinking team. We are writing tools for ourselves. A uh, lot of the testing tools are not sufficient for our needs. Uh, query search, we are uh, license courses, yes. Uh, but there are certain things that we are building our own tools in-house. Um, yes, it is on a modern stack of development. Uh, to test that aspect, how is it going to cater to my needs of the business, I still put it through the rigorous test of the data behind it and things like that. Yes, there we can apply our own application mindset of, you know, or how you do the tooling chain for your application uh, way of doing CI, CD, we have already applied it. Yes, we have Artifactory and Docker and containers, all of those things. But when we talk specifically on data, data, business catering to that, we are limited by certain things. We are moving towards the cloud and all of that. If we shut off one thing and then get into big data and uh, Hadoop and those areas, perhaps maybe we'll have, but then that's also work in progress. Um, so far, I think uh, we are here. Any questions so far? Are we So if you see there on the top, right, that big data local that you see is nothing but our dev environment. Yeah, right. yeah it's it's still, it's in the cloud, but it's our it's as good as our local environment. We do our uh, semi-unit testing sort of a thing. Is our query right? Uh, we get our checks and balances right. We are not miss, missing an index, reviews, those progression happens. But the voluminous of the data, that is what we stage it, put it into this stack. So only when that passes, we push it here. So that's a good question, yeah. So some are local, but our local is again spinning off that virtual environment where we work. Coding happens here, we spin off that. That's one step that we have to bring in. Sorry? So those are some things that are more specific to the products that you're dealing with, right? And that is where we are asking teams to come up with solutions. So we do have, uh, we do use query search in some of those cases, but largely it is more about teams automating some of those processes. You could, like if I could use a very raw example, you could always take a backup today and run your tests against the data tomorrow. So that, that could also be explored because we are not in that state where we can say that we have achieved complete testing. And in fact, if you see at the later slide, we would be talking about how we have a long way to go in terms of test data management. Like one of the steps that we have is isolated testing and uh, test data management. Where we are working with teams now is for the area that you are working in, what is the data from a functional standpoint, you can actually containerize that. This is not going to change or it is yesterday's data. You can parallelize that and get it ready so that when your feature set is ready, you can push it against that. But yes, it will not address the volume problem. If you want to get real time kind of a thing, there are always trade-offs. You have to deal with those trade-offs. And what is the value or the opportunity cost you are going to lose by with these trade-offs? These are again decision points. Uh, it's not about just technically alone I can do this. It is more about is it worth it for me to spend this and can I spend that do I have the time? Now, if I want it in one hour, but you also have to do it in terabyte, uh, terabyte, I mean, uh, terabytes of data, we still don't have something there, uh, across all of your regression test suites and all that. So we have to compromise something, but if the change is quicker, we will fail through to, you know, let it go there and it fails because we can always funnel in a newer change as quickly. And that's where our two hour kind of a construct will help us as opposed to saying, let me do all of these things and wait for a 30 day construct and then get it ready because it is curtailing a lot of other speed aspects. Can we wait for that? As we go through it, we'll finish it. Maybe that will answer that. In case we, uh, we don't answer that, maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, don't 
different in terms of what? In terms of uh, capacity? Capacity usually are staging so. Correct. Yes. Okay. So what we try to do, if you look at the local, you would generally run your unit tests there. And your stage is where you would not only be running your unit test, but also the uh, integration test. So from a volume perspective, uh, capacity perspective, our stage environments are usually around 10% of production, right? But it's unrealistic to expect uh, the same volume, right? So you would probably extrapolate the results. Now with respect to volume that you want to test, it really depends on your application. Right? Is my application something or is my flow something that would need to return results within say 10 minutes. Right? In that case, I would probably do more volume testing in stage. I definitely have that flexibility of asking for more space. So again, what I'm probably getting into too many details here, but then uh, while it is 10% uh, of say your prod environment, that 10% is also shared across different teams. So you could always go back to your infrastructure partners and say that, okay, this, I need to test for this volume and for that I need this much of space, maybe for a month. So uh, we don't have a fixed uh, mechanism of calculating how much of volume we are going to test there. It really depends on your need. But there are provisions to test for the entire volume. So monitoring, yep. mm -hmm. right. So monitoring, there are two kinds of monitoring, right? One is your flow itself, your jobs, are they running? Right? I might have them running, usually we have it in a sequence, we call them a batch. It starts at say 5 a.m. in the morning and it might run till 5 p.m. In that case, I need to make sure that the jobs are running well. So that is one form of monitoring that continues throughout the day. Right? The second form of monitoring is essentially once your data is available, is it right or not right? So that will usually happen depending on the frequency of your data loads. It, could, it will happen immediately after your data load. Most of my data will probably be like a daily refresh. So I will run the flows today and the data will be available by 5 a.m. 5 a.m. CST. So at that time, as soon as the data is available, there will be monitors that will trigger. So that is part of the uh, load process itself, I should say. All right, let's look through. Um, so here's a quick demo on real life, how we do CI, CD um, from a check-in process to <coughs> taking it all the way through from a pipeline perspective, just to give you an idea on one of the templates that we have used. So as you can see, there are multiple steps. We have also incur, um, got a lot more steps than in your conventional uh, development because here it's our trigger point is also from how do you actually from your bridge when you uh, raise a pull request, getting into your you know dev environment mode, is all your sanity tests done at a lower level and then only you trigger off from a staging perspective and all the way through. So there are a lot more steps that we have got. Um, and this is also all the way through from a pull request, how do we even get to a deployed state? 
So this is again, um, it's not completely automated in terms of everything is done by Jenkins here. Uh, at least the pull request part, when the first set of the tests are all successful, you get a green bar. Then only we raise a pull request for the higher order environment and then there is further set of flows which will run to get you into a stage and prod kind of an environment and we have minimalistic set of steps there, including the change management process. Because like we said, our production is still controlled, uh, but what we have automated in many of some of the cases is automate that whole change management aspect. Before, what used to take us time is to raise a change request, get somebody approve it, and then push it in manually and stuff like that. That we have automated. So there was one thing that went by in this. It was a quick demo, but the what I want to highlight here is we do this test in terms of um, from a source to your target, did we get whatever data? Typically, you would see in, the, in our kind of work more in terms of count star, whether if you have 1,000, 10,000 rows there and 10,000 rows did make it. Uh, that Because that's, for us, is important because we are not uh, leaving out data, right? Because anything could happen in that. What we are also encouraging teams and doing more is, are these 1,000 data representing the right uh, I would say business areas or whatever is your key things that you are looking at, not just any thousand rows in terms of matching the count of it, but it is also in terms of whether it is store level or whatever, are your 10 stores and then 10 stores, thousand rows is actually matching there. It's not just about thousand rows of any number of stores and which number of stores. So I think qualitatively we are improving our tests also. Uh, that we want it because that is critical for us to get our test data management right. That strategy right and isolation of the test data. Uh, this is a is a foundation for that. Uh, that's where we are investing now. So this is uh, thing as as we spoke about the journey right. Um, one is we are fundamentally not like the general developer, developer community, everybody hooks on to Git and we do this, right? We are data people. We don't do some of this Git work and stuff like that. But however, all of the SQLs that we write, all of the shell scripts that we write, or even the data stage or any of the work that we do are first class citizens on our GitHub, right? Uh, there is a check-in process. There is a lot of the things that you, which is no different from that, right? Uh, what we wanted to do was why is, why are things happening so late or why are why are we not checking as frequently as we could do, as we should be? Uh, we built our own monitor um, internally just to showcase that, you know, how are we doing relative to that? This is not a comparison. This is, again, not policing. It is for us to reflect upon as a team how much of the commits are we doing on a daily basis? Uh, how many pull requests are going in? How many master mergers are we doing? Because that is what is going to seed you for deployment. Um, today, if we, when we started off, we were at probably about 30 deployments, all of our deployments, whatever numbers or the stacks that you see is only on master mode. But a lot of commits keep happening at a low, lower environment, right? So if you come up to this 250 level, uh, 250 deployments per month sort of a thing, it's all facilitated by a lot of these check-ins, which is on smaller granular pieces that is happening. To back that, what Pradeep spoke earlier, more in terms of teams have written now their own tests and coverage. Uh, it could be your review on your shell scripts and things like that. That is facilitating this change. Before it was all manual process. Anything that I had to check in had to be with a manual review. Uh, now, now that we have automated it, it is facilitated by the pull request. It is facilitated by those uh, rigorous mechanisms in terms of automation. We are now able to commit things a lot more easily because we have a safety net. Um, without this, uh, it was always derailing us. So to summarize our journey, what we've achieved the last two years, when we talk about accomplishments, there are a whole list of others as well, but we thought we'll stick to three because that's the only thing that can probably stick with you guys as well. Uh, focus team for implementation and ops. So earlier we had a team of 40, which was totally focused on making sure that implementations are happening. Remember, it was a very intensive, manual intensive process. And uh, the ops team did all the monitoring. So we had a team of 40. Now it is down to four, which means that we have 36 additional people who can work on active development and add that much more value to the business. Right. Uh, speed of deployments, you guys have heard it so many times, 30 days to two hours. So it is no longer a daunting task or we don't even need to focus one engineer one month to just get the deployment done. Right? It's down to two hours. 
30 deployments to 250, just like the previous slide. So we had only 30 deployments earlier. Now we are uh, up to 250. Now again, the key call out is yes. Does 250 sound great when you look at it from an Amazon perspective? <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, again, it's not any apps or small things, right? It is. We are talking about at a data, at a volume that we are talking about. We are able to make these changes. Um, I'm not saying can, can it be. 10x more than this, of course, um, we will not deny that. But this has been our journey. Um, we've been a team who used to be like big teams working out of their own set of cubicles once in a month, once in two months, do those delivery process. Every time there is a review, there is a management aspect uh, looking at it. Now we have come to a point where even before the business sees certain decision metrics going wrong on their monitors, we've been able to capture as part of a CCD process itself. We have got an equivalent set of a monitor which can at least give us the indication that you know what this data is not going to come out right maybe we have to correct this before the business comes and asks us for a change uh, we are become much more uh, proactive in the way we will attend to the business read as opposed to being reactive from a business standpoint and then go talk to multiple teams and figure out where this thing happened and why did it happen and look at okay which of the data set caused this kind of a problem and those are the commotions which we had when we started off this journey. Today, I think a lot of those things have come down significantly. Um, like we said, uh, it's still in progress, right? So we still have to attack this big challenge of test data management isolation. I think the, the crux lies there. Um, if we have to get it to 10x, it's a possibility. Um, but we are hoping we will get there. Next year could be a Next different. Year? Yeah, so I think we had this, but before of this, I think we spoke a lot about some of these things. Um, anything? No. Okay. It's a small thing. Um, so the booth that I found most interesting was the enterprise merchandising stall. And what I like most about this team is they're very vertically sliced. You know, they talk to the consumers understand the requirements, they go back to the data sources, come back, build the demo card, and then interact with the person who's raised the request to understand if that serves the purpose or not. A lot of interaction, a lot of learning. Personally, I have met supply chain uh, data foundation team where I want to uh, make sure that we connect even beyond this Adobe Fair, understand certain supply chain metrics that uh, will be crucial for the model that my team is building. Definitely a great platform to learn. There's a lot of opportunity to cross pollinate amongst each other. Natural way of collaborations that can come out of these forums. Overall, a great experience. Looking forward to more such in the future. Booths that particularly stood out were the enterprise booth, which demoed all the insights and how they gather those insights from various means to put up the most competitive price for target, uh, and our guest IQ strategy which deep dived into insights like if a shopper goes into Target and they buy a pack of diapers, what are the other things that they're buying and how can we build promotions around those things to drive footfalls to our stores. Uh, overall, a really, really interesting day, a Friday well spent at the NRV. Right, so this is another investment, right? Now, when you look at it, this is not a one-time affair. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is, it's a, when we talk about culture shift, a lot of people talk about culture shift. How do you actually make a culture shift? What is it in, in culture shift? Uh, this is an investment which we've done. It, it happens every four months, we run this Adobe Fair across multiple locations. Uh, we, we said that we've created product teams. Each Scrum team, Agile team is a product team. Uh, the idea behind these Adobe fairs is people go and mingle across each other, try to learn from each other what product they are building. Even though we are data, we are data, we see it as a product. We also have downstream, upstream. Uh, I did mention about OKRs. Uh, when we do a funnel in the OKR also, people talk about multiple teams, who is going to get impacted by what, because we are in the crux of either we could be a recipient of something or we are giving something to somebody else, which could be impacting. And lot of, and we are also building our own capabilities in terms of building our own products, uh, getting new open source solutions. Um, what we just show, showcase here is just of 
yes we did ci cd kind of a representation from a jenkins perspective but when i look at it from a tooling it's completely democratized in the way you want to use tools uh, we 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 use ansible there is openshift vmas servers which are there to support us then there is docker kubernetes um, we are also using chef to uh, uh, to manage our infrastructure all of this is in the mix uh, uh, we just don't want to get lost in the infrastructure aspect of it but more focus on how we are getting the data components right but these are all the support structures which are there and every team is choosing what tool and how they want to do and when they apply that the challenges that come out of it or the learning that come out of it is what we share in this kind of forums um the interesting bit is every everybody in the management is also participating in it uh and it's about selling it to the business and why we are producing this kind of a value if we have missed something how can we better this with that thank you if you have any questions we'll be here around this pradeep my name is ravi kumar thank you we have time done try and do the same thing what has been done by one team across all the teams understood but how did you empower your team how did you motivate your team to write some tests which were not written in the past or which were written for a coverage sake so that is again working with the team closely and asking them those questions what is what is relevant here which can support this kind of a deployment for this deployment are you having adequate tests and what's the price you are going to pay if you are if something were to fail uh, so it it's not because about you're this. saying by creating more awareness that you were able to motivate it's also working closely with him like pradeep and team spend a lot of time working with the individual teams to bring that focus that you need to attack these tests uh it's not just yeah democracy is there but it's also thought through in terms of this is important for this to happen and investment is required and there is support structure to do enable that for you and and you could also incentivize them right i mean you could always challenge them saying okay write these test cases as soon as it passes i am going to move it to production anything that happens in production is your responsibility right i mean that could be one of the ways if you're still seeing resistance yes right? yes but then over a period of time once your team starts realizing the benefits of all this i am sure they're going to start doing it by, uh, by themselves not by me right. okay. our show and tell sessions also propagated a lot of these things there was resistance but how did we break the resistance not by telling them it's more about people participating in this and seeing that value and in some way it's kind so of did, that symbolic did, did you bring some practices like tdd bdd as part of your feature yeah i mean a lot of those we have dojo sessions which are being conducted people participate into that as well uh, there is embedded coaching which happens uh, with the team as in a need basis um, so it is not like one size fits all we did this and hence we got this it is combination of things that has been done um and the results are from that from a context it has to be derived from that and i think once you have one of your teams reaping the benefits right they need to evangelize this with the other team because that works best i mean from what we have seen rather than us going and coaching individual team once you have a success story make sure that it is uh it is more visible we have seen lot of resistance that's the reason i asked <laughs> so yeah i mean that resistance is something that will take time to go away yeah. just need concerted effort thank you cool already i think run out of time thank you we are around so if you have any questions